Jeff Boynton uh, made his first psychophysical observations when he was six. First serious official ones, because his father was a distinguished visual scientist, uh, and uh, cut his teeth programming a Maxwellian view system as a schoolboy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he did his, his, his entire West Coast man. He did his uh, undergraduate work at UCSD a year ago. Then uh, was a postdoc at Santa Barbara. A graduate student at Santa Barbara. Graduate student mm -hmm. at Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. Postdoc at Stanford. That's right. Yep. And then was at the Sork Institute for 10 years and is now a professor in Seattle, the University of Washington. However, it's our good fortune that this year he's on sabbatical at the University of York, and that's how we had the happy chance of listening to his work. Thank you. Jeff. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me? Is this loud enough? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, uh, you might have been to Ioni Fine's lecture. She was here a few weeks ago. She's my spouse, and can't tell anymore from her accent, but she's British, and one of the reasons why we're here is we have our kids going to school uh, at York because of your superior educational system. Um, we bailed out of the Seattle educational system and brought our kids out there. <clears throat> question is, what are we going to do after this? Because now they're too far ahead um, to go back. So we've got a problem. Um, yeah, so I, my name's Jeff Boynton. I work at the University of Washington, um, normally where I'm supposed to be. And uh, I am a probably an example of a Nepo scientist, right? You've heard of these Nepo babies? Yeah, so my dad was a color vision psychophysicist, so I had all the advantages of growing up in a scientific community, um, especially having a, my first job was programming in my dad's lab. And so uh, lots of, as you say, privilege these days um, of, in my career. Um, Back in Seattle, I run a, their uh, brain imaging center that we put together, uh, just in time for me to start my sabbatical. And um, so I am, my background really is in visual psychophysics, lower level vision, you know, good bores and you know, gratings and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and then brain imaging stuff, because I was an early adopter uh, starting my postdoc at Stanford in the, in the early 90s uh, when fMRI was first taking off. A lot of low hanging fruit back then. Um, and so. That's been sort of my bread and butter uh, and grant proposal money is from the low level psychophysics stuff. But more recently we moved, as you can see, into higher level processing like vision. And <clears throat> it's uh, kind of interesting, I've done this a few times in my career where I've stepped uh, into other people's fields and kind of stepped into hornet's nest and caused lots of trouble um, <clears throat> being ignorant. It turns out that this idea of parallel versus serial processing and reading is a really contentious topic in the reading. We didn't know that. Um, and so uh, there's an interesting debate going on about when you're reading whether things are happening in parallel versus serial. We jumped into this uh, because I was studying divided attention in, with really boring grading stimuli. And it turns out that, I'm not really going to talk about that today, but it turns out that for really boring grading stimuli detecting orientation, you can really do two things at once pretty well. So you can divide your attention between two locations in the visual field and pay attention to the orientation of things almost as well as you can for a single stimulus. And then my colleague John Palmer at the time uh, and I said, well, let's try to break this. What sort of stimulus or task would make it, can you not do at the same time? So I've heard that reading is really hard to do in parallel. Or in, <laughs> and so, okay. And so we adapted our paradigm for, with words and sure enough, this happened. So that's how we got here into this hornet's nest. I'm not a reading expert and I'll, and please correct me if I say things that are wrong. Um, I've got plenty of time to get through these slides, and so if there's questions along the way, let me know. Um, and uh, we'll see how this goes. But reading is interesting um, uh, from like an evolutionary perspective, right? So I guess the first written words were about 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, cuneiform writing. And then the literacy rates in our society really didn't start going up until, you know, 1500s or so with the, what I guess was the printing press. This is the classic story, right? As soon as the written word was available to the public, the uh, reading rates, um, the, the literacy rates um, increased over time. This is in the UK. Um, 
and it's now near 100%, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and uh, I was just talking to my colleagues at York at, at a pub last night, and they were complaining about the um, the inability of the undergraduates to read and write. And uh, but on the other hand, I think kids now, kids these days, are probably reading more words now than I did, just you know, 280 characters at a time. Right. So these days, um, there's a lot of reading going on. It's not necessarily in the form of books. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> So what's interesting is this is relatively recent in terms of evolutionary history. Our brain has not evolved to read, yet it is a very, very natural task for those who know how to do this, right? In fact, as you probably know, um, you often can't not read, right? The, the Stroop effect is the classic example of words, uh, the, the meaning of a word uh, having priority over the, say, the color or other property of the word. You think you know, John, the color vision scientist, color is like so basic and built into the retina that you should be able to name a color much more easily than to read the word yellow, right? But as you know from the classic strip effect, the, 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 the meaning of the word, green, for example, interferes with the ability to identify the color, um, which is kind of weird because reading is not what we're designed to do, if you believe in design. <clears throat> um... What I, where I got into this, and I mentioned in the beginning, is uh, having to do with divided attention and serial versus parallel processing. Now, in the very onset, reading is inherently serial, like all vision, right? You, you point your eyes somewhere, and the whole image is projected onto your retina, you know, upside down and backwards, but it's there, and it's all there in parallel. And the photoreceptors respond all independent, well, not independently of each other, but they all respond to the visual stimulus in parallel, and all this stuff gets passed into your brain. And on the other hand, um, reading is inherently a serial process, right? You have to read words left to right in English, um, top to bottom. And so what I was interested in is, is how do we go from this inherently parallel process, which is vision, to the serial process of reading, right? Um, and how and where in the brain does this transformation happen, right? Somewhere between the retina and whatever consciousness we're having while we're reading um, <clears throat> is, is a transformation between parallel to serial. And we're trying to implicate particular parts of the brain into where this bottleneck, think of it as a bottleneck between parallel processing and serial processing is occurring. <clears throat> we have a hypothesis about that, which I'll get to. Um, so, consider uh, the visual input when you're focusing on a word in a page. You don't have to read this, this is just an introduction from one of our papers. But when you're staring in the middle of this page, like, you know, one of the words, the word reading right there in the middle, um, <clears throat> your whole retina, both retinas, are getting the whole page, right? But obviously you're not reading the whole word, the whole page in parallel. Well, of course, the first step we do in this transformation between parallel and serial is, the, is based on the fact that uh, our peripheral vision is bad, right? Our peripheral vision drops, our acuity and peripheral vision drops off pretty radically with eccentricity. Actually, that's a whole interesting topic in itself. Um, we're actually pretty unaware of how bad our peripheral vision is because we don't use it really for reading, right? We don't, or high acuity tasks. What do we do when we want to get high acuity from information out there? We move our eyes to it, right? Um, peripheral vision really is, you could argue that one of the purposes of your peripheral vision system is to figure out where we should direct our foveal vision, right? <clears throat> so that's the first step. Um, that's why we move our eyes while we read. Here's a, uh, a eye trace from, we have an eye tracking system in our lab and just had someone read this paragraph. And this is where one person happened to be moving their eyes while they read this paragraph. <clears throat> um, one thing you'll notice, and this is common in the, in the literature, is that you don't land your eyes on every word though, right? People, experienced readers, skip words, land between words. And this is kind of where we come in. So even though eye movements partially deal with this issue of parallel versus serial processing, we don't foveate, foveate on every word. At least experienced readers don't do that. So still, there's an issue about what do we do when we saccade and land between words or we actually you know, have to pull out more information on a given saccade. Um, and that's where the idea of the, the people that we're fighting with um, believe that parallel processing is happening in reading. It's because during a saccade, information comes in, you get all this, you get the, the words in your periphery in, in parallel, or paraphobia in parallel, move on to the next word, right? <clears throat> or, 
are we actually, when we land between words, are we pulling information in serially during each saccade? And that's what I'm getting at. <clears throat> so you can, I have a kind of a cheesy animation of what the, the retinal image looks like while you're reading. And you can see you're skipping words, and you can kind of get the idea that you're not getting every word in the middle of the visual field, right? So something interesting is going on during reading. <clears throat> Um, and here's kind of just a really simple task. If you fixate on that, that plus right there, depending on where you are in the, in the room, um, and just try to read both words at the same time, you can, you can do it, right? Um, sort of. But what I find when I do this, I've never seen anybody talk about this, I find myself not really, I find myself switching between the two words, right? No matter how hard I try, I can't like read them in parallel, whatever that means. I find myself just getting face and then base, and it's really hard to do in parallel. And it has the same feeling as these, you know, classic ambiguous stimuli that we use all the time, like the Necker cube. You can see it one way or the other, and you can, you know, if you if you've like me, you've stared at these things enough, you can voluntarily make it switch. But I can never see both versions of the back and the front at the same time, right? And it's also true for like the classic duck rabbit illusion. I can see the duck, I can see the rabbit, but I never see the duck and rabbit at the same time. Maybe some people can. Or, you know, like the classic face-face illusion. It switches, right? It has the same feeling that these things are happening when I try to read two words at the same time, just subjectively for what that's worth. Uh, it feels like it's happening serially rather than in parallel at the same time. So, how do we figure, how do we figure out if people can read words at the same time? Well, we try to get people to read <laughs> words at the same time in the lab. And the paradigm is really simple. Um, it's a sequential paradigm where subjects were given a fixation point at the beginning with cues on the left or the right. Say for the subject green was a tend to the, uh, a tend to the green side and or maybe both sides at the same time. And importantly, the words we had were flanked by masking um, nonsense characters. And on any given task, any given trial or block of trials, subjects were cued to either try to attend to the word on the left or the word on the right, uh, stage left, stage right, or both at the same time. <clears throat> um, and the task in this particular case was a, um, um, a task where we were asking, is, is, was this word something that was living or non-living? We've done various other tasks. We've done semantic categorization task and things like that. <clears throat> Turns out it doesn't matter too much what the task is as long as you're trying to get some sort of something about the meaning of the word. <clears throat> um, importantly, uh, these these masks uh, are crucial uh, for this task, and it took us probably too long to figure this out. If you just do this experiment with like a one-frame presentation of the word on a monitor without any mask, you can get both words, um, and that you think that's because we're working in parallel. But it turns out that the basically the iconic memory or whatever it is, the visual persistence of those words, is lasts long enough you can you can do this task really well, regardless of how quickly you present, uh, as long as it's high enough contrast, how quickly you present both words. So you need this mask to interrupt the processing. My whole thesis back when I was when I was a kid was on visual masking with gradings and stuff like that. And we Masking is really complicated in itself. I wish I understood it. We just use it as a tool. I don't even want to get into the physiology of what's happening during a mask, except that it's interrupting the processing is what we like to say. <laughs> so this is such a simple experiment that you can do it with PowerPoint. So you can say, okay, um, whoops, where's my words? Yeah, pay attention to the word. I start on the right. Yeah, okay, let's try, sorry. Okay, let's start with the right. I'm going to give you, you just saw it, but fixate on the plus right there. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to have a bunch of letters, words, letters, and forget about the stuff on the left. Don't look to the right. Fixate on the cross and see if you can, there's going to be a word in there and tell me if it is uh, an animal or, or living thing or not. Did you see anything? Was it an animal? Yeah, you saw it. How about the left side? Let's try it again. Don't look at it. Just fixation point. You see anything? Yeah. How many of you guys? How many of you all saw what that was? It's hard in PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, these are the words. 
On the right side was an animal, the left side was not. Yeah. Um, you might find it harder on the left side than the right side. And this is a weird thing that we <laughs> rediscovered. We had no idea what we were doing because uh, we'd done this with basic visual stimuli and we didn't see any laterality effects. But in reading, for some reason, there is a huge... Yeah, just reading people in the, in the room here. For some reason, there's a huge advantage to the right side versus the left. Um, I don't know why. Does anybody know why? So there's interesting hypotheses having to do with, well, the right side is the left hemisphere, and that's language, right? That'd be cool. There's a boring hypothesis, which is the beginning of the word is more important to identifying it than the end of the word, and the word on the right, the beginning is closer to the phobia, right? So there's the boring hypothesis. But in any case, it happens, and it's a really strong effect. <clears throat> You'll see in a second. So two cues, like I said, you can either focus on one side or the other, or you try to do both at the same time and respond uh, to both words, so two responses. And the way we represent our results is using something called an AOC curve, uh, Intentional Operating Characteristic Curve. This is something that George Sperling invented, like everything else. Um, and it's kind of fun. The way you plot your results is in the single task conditions, where you're only uh, cued to attend to one stimulus, um, you can plot those results on either each of the two axes. So the, right, the, the accuracy on the right side, when you're only supposed to attend to the right word, forget about the left word, um, you plot along the x-axis here. And then the other set of trials, um, you, present, you, you get the percent correct for the word on the left on the y-axis there, right? So these are two completely different uh, blocks of results, right? Um, you'll notice already that even for the single task condition, we do 90% correct on the right and only 75 on the left. And almost all subjects, all subjects uh, do this. I should point out little details. Um, the rate of uh, presentation uh, varied from subject to subject. We titrated the rate of presentation after training so that they should get around 80% correct um, before we even started our experiments. So, so during the training period, we did some staircase stuff to make sure that they were the, we changed the uh, interstimulus intervals across for each subject so that they would be around 80% correct on the single task conditions like this. Right. So for this, so, so for this subject, it, they average around 80% correct. <clears throat> so what's fun about the AOC is that we have this other block of conditions where they're supposed to respond to both sides, right? And we can actually plot that on the same graph somewhere up here, right? Whoa, somewhere up here. This is saying that I have no internet. Um, somewhere up here, because um, I get an X value and a Y value for each of the two um, sides, even though they're the same trials. Right? And we have some predictions. If um, Suppose you could operate just as well in the dual task condition, divided attention condition, as the single task condition. If that were the case, we'd expect to be somewhere on this dotted line, really, out here in this corner, right? Because the performance on the left should be the same in the dual task condition as for the single task condition, and same for the right. So we should end up here in this corner right there. And you can think of this as be like the, the parallel processing point in the uh, AOC, right? On the other hand, if, if you're unable to read both words, uh, you're going to get somewhere down towards the origin, right? And really the most extreme would be somewhere along this straight line here. It turns out that along the straight line would be um, where you're basically getting it 80% correct on one side and guessing on the other, and maybe just randomly assigning it between different trials, right? You'd expect to find someone on the diagonal, and that would be a, a, a huge um, divided attention effect, which is apparently really, really hard to get in psychophysics. But when we did our experiment, we landed right on that line. Um, and not only that, but we're way down here in the corner. Um, meaning we're, there's a huge bias towards the right side. And what really seems to be happening is on most trials, subjects are getting it right 80% you know, of the time on the right side and guessing on the left, um, even though we're, they're trying to do both sides at the same time. So it turns out it's pretty unusual to be able to land down here in the corner. And John Palmer and Alex White and I were all excited because you know, like we actually don't have the res uh, have a, we have some papers for detecting orientation and stuff like that where we were, you, see, you land up here in the corner uh, for really simple tasks, like orientation and, and, and uh, simple color task, color difference task. <clears throat> so, that was interesting. Um, 
So this is evidence of some kind of bottleneck, is the words we use for the divided attention literature, um, that allows only one, to be, only, word, only one word to be processed per trial, um, forcing the observers to guess about the other side, if you land right in the diagonal. So that's the psychophysical stuff. And I just threw this slide here. We have a whole bunch of other papers before and after using different stimuli. And if you actually use the same uh, stimuli, letters and words, um, but have people detect whether their, one of the words was um, slightly tinted, say, red versus blue. Um, tried to, we didn't, it's not a really color vision experiment. It was not very well calibrated. I apologize. Um, but we did titrate things to get the percent correct about right. <clears throat> My dad would be rolling over in his grave knowing that I didn't do any colorimetry there. But if you do that, uh, you end up way up here, way off the diagonal, right? This, this smooth curve right here is the prediction from something called a, um, a limited capacity model, which is basically a, it's almost a sampling model. It's a st statistical model where you're sampling the left and right sides, uh, and there's a square to two in there that keeps you from being up in the corner, but also keeps you from being down here in the diagonal. So it's kind of like the, the default probability, prob probability model. Um, and if you do a different kind of task, a lexical decision task, which is more about the meaning, you end up down here in the diagonal or maybe even below. So what's nice about being off here in the diagonal, it means that we're not down here on, uh, in this slide right here, we're not down here because of some stupid reason having to do with memory limitations or response interference or something like that. Because the dual task is different, right? You have to remember both sides and you have to respond both sides and you might get them mixed up and we have also sort of analyses about um, interference in the left and right side. But because you can, with the same paradigm, do well, it means that there's not a memory limitation or a, a response in limitation in this paradigm. Any questions about the basic paradigm? Um, yes? Two different interstimulus intervals. Yes, we, for every paradigm and every subject, we messed around with interstimulus intervals so that be a bit 80% correct on the single task condition, yeah. And this is quite a bit slower, that's right. Um, and then there's a debate uh, with reviewers and stuff about how uh, can you actually switch uh, for a long interstimulus interval. And 160 milliseconds is long enough that maybe there might be enough resources to be able to try the other side. If, but that's, it's kind of up in the air there. That's a good observation, yeah, it's true. It did vary. <clears throat> But certainly at 31 milliseconds, I don't think anybody would argue that you can, you can switch attention between the left and right side uh, with the mask like this. <clears throat> okay. So we, we think it's not a memory or decision limit, and it's not just due to the masking process alone also, because we use masking for this experiment as well. <clears throat> All right, so let's kind of poke around in the brain and see what's going on. Um, and so what we've done is we, um, well, this is, my, this is my slide when I was trying to promote our new imaging center to a general audience. You can use fMRI and brain imaging to study all sorts of cool stuff. Most of you know that. Um, and then I've got my Bozo, I call it a Bozo slide about fMRI works, which is just a quick review. Something about the fact that hemod um, oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin have different magnetic properties, and for reasons we don't fully understand, if uh, an increase in brain activity leads to an increase in oxygenated hemoglobin, which turns out to, when using uh, images in, in a specific, uh, acquiring images in a very specific way, it actually leads to brighter pixels. So we even got the sign right when there's more activity, we get brighter pixels, which is convenient. Um, I can go all day on this. It turns out that we don't even understand how this works. It's 25 years, 30 years later. Uh, it's a little maddening. I, hope this, I was hoping that the people would figure this out by now. But um, we still use this um, as a way of measure brain, measuring brain activity. But fMRI is not brain activity. fMRI is measuring blood oxygenation sloshing around in your head. But in any case, and then there's the crash course in the visual system. Um, we have the ability to uh, map out the retina topic visual areas, areas V1, V2, V3, using standardized techniques, and we can also uh, try to localize other parts of the visual system by using contrasting, say, faces versus scrambled objects, scrambled faces and things like that to try to identify different chunks of the back and bottom of the visual cortex 
eventual, eventual uh, visual areas um, associated with different um, types of stimuli. So this is, uh, I spent almost all of my career back here in the retinotopic visual areas, studying responses to contrast and boring stimulus parameters of contrast and orientation and, and things like that. And so it was, a, it was a little interesting for us to jump off the, the continent of the retinotopic maps into the open ocean of uh, the ventral occipital cortex, where there's you know, just blobs that seem to be preferentially responding to different things. Um, it was a little scary uh, for us. <clears throat> We had Jason Yeatman back at Stanford who has uh, helped us with this because he did a lot of work in reading and fMRI. Uh, unfortunately, he's left us for Stanford, which is boo. But at the time, uh, he worked with us on this project and got us off the continent of the endotopic maps. Um, so we basically just ran this experiment in the scanner after mapping out the visual areas. And, um, and this is based on uh, a lot of stuff about attention that we know about in the visual system. Uh, and so, for example, we know that spatial attention, if you're attending to one part of the visual field, leads to a larger fMRI response in regions of the brain that are associated or retinotopically mapped to that particular part of the visual field. Mm -hmm. Many of you already know this. This is uh, stuff that actually turns out three papers got published right around the same time, ours and a couple other papers, one from UCSD, from um, C. Pillier's lab, and then Tutel's group, all published the same result at the same time. This is this classic low-hanging fruit situation where you line the scanner, you measure the brain's response to something boring like visual gratings, fixate on the center and attend to the left stimulus for a while, attend to the right stimulus for a while, make sure you don't move your eyes, right? And keep the visual stimulus constant, and that's the rule in these experiments is you keep the visual stimulus constant throughout the whole scan, and all you're changing is the locus of spatial attention. So any changes you see in the brain are not due to retinal image changes, they're due to attentional effects, right? And it just was an obvious experiment to run. There's some PET studies that Ron Mangan had done before that just didn't have the resolution to pull this out. I got time. So um, at the time, the, this was back in the 90s, back in the last century, um, there was the monkey physiologists were discovering that there were attentional effects as early as, say, area MT or area V4 in the macaque. And at the time, that was kind of heresy because a lot of the, like, you know, the, um, a lot of the monkey physiologists really thought of the early visual processing as a feed-forward image processing system and stuff like attention were things that are happening, you know, in front of the head, and that's William James stuff, right? That's not visual science stuff. <clears throat> and so we actually spent a whole summer because I was the subject in this experiment, um, the whole summer training ourselves up to do a motion discrimination, speed discrimination task in a very specific part of our visual field, because we thought, well, the reason why uh, these physiologists were getting these attentional effects or these monkeys were overtrained, um, they'd been, that's their job, right? They just sat in this cage and they, and they did the same task over and over and over again, and by the time they started measuring these attentional effects, these monkeys had been like overtrained for this very specific stimulus. So we overtrained ourselves. Um, and this is a cheesy movie that I made um, uh, from this, these results from this experiment back in 99. And shown here is an, I, the, is an iconic vision, or, uh, uh, icon of what the stimulus was doing. The real stimulus alternated, the attention tended, alternated back and forth every 20 seconds. It's really slow. This is sped, sped up by a factor of like five. And the yellow circle wasn't there in the real experiment because that would have been a confound. Um, but their little cue was changing. And it was done in a trial, psychophysical style, trial, trial, response, trial, trial, response. But the basic idea is here. But the data is real. And back then, we were able to map out the location of the primary visual co cortex, which is in blue. This is a pseudo-coronal slice. And we, these little blobs out here in the side, that's the area MT. That's the motion selective area of my brain. This is my brain, my young brain. Um, and sure enough, we get the attentional effects in MT like we were we thought we might get based on the monkey physiology, but what was real heresy was we were getting these effects even stronger in the primary visual cortex, which monkey physiologists were unable to find. Um, in fact, we had a hard time, all, th all three groups had a really hard time publishing that result uh, because we, had, we ran into physiology reviewers that just didn't believe it at all. Now you can take anybody off the street, throw them in the scanner and say, attend to this thing and you'll get a bigger response in V1. In fact, the attentional effects in V1 are a problem. They're, they're so strong that they're kind of a confound that you have to deal with in a lot of experiments. 
But anyway, this is a basic result where if you attend to a stimulus on the left, on the left, you get a bigger response on the left, the other side of the, of the primary visual cortex, right? The lateral, the contralateral aspect. <clears throat> well, we basically replicated this result in our experiment by having people lie in the scanner. Instead of presenting gradings, we presented two words with the mask and all that. Same paradigm. We're able to get the same behavioral results in the scanner, which is nice. Um, and sorry about the lack of error bars here. This is for a general audience, but these effects are huge. Um, this is a replication of the basic spatial attention effect that in the early visual areas, this is actually V1 to V3 all merged together. Um, the, when, you, when you measure the response to the attended stimulus, you get a much larger response than the unattended stimulus. This is actually collapsed across both hemispheres. So this is results in the right hemisphere, when you're tending to the left, averaged in with the opposite, right? And also averaged across subjects. <clears throat> Again, you can see there's this, uh, almost a 50% increase in, in fMRI response for an attended versus unattended word. It's actually a bigger effect than we get for gradings and stuff. It's kind of interesting. But the interesting thing for us is what happens when you attend to both words at the same time. So another set of trials where now we're doing both, right, versus the control blind condition. That's the divided attention condition. And what would you predict? So if, you know, remember you can't read two words at the same time, right? Hopefully, if you believe that. <laughs> Not everyone believes our results, but at least in our very specific experimental conditions, you, you can't. You can't read two words at the same time with the mask and all that. So you might expect the divided attention effect to be down here, right? Because you, V1 can't process both words at the same time. There's the bottleneck, right? Um, but what we get is, in the divided attention case, is you get a big response uh, to the word when it is one of the two words that you're attending to. In other words, if you're attending to two words, the response to that word is just as large as, it was the as if it was the only word that you're attending to in the early visual areas. And you can see this is not consistent with the behavioral results. You have to have some kind of linking hypothesis, which is involved like a bigger response should lead to better performance, which we always kind of brush under the carpet, but we have to have some kind of linking hypothesis, some kind of signal to noise argument that a bigger response is better to lead to better performance. And if you buy that, then this is not consistent with our behavior results, at least in, in the early visual areas, right? We can actually plot this result, uh, so the bottleneck is not an early visual cortex. We can plot this result um, as a neural AOC by simply taking the same results, plotting the results from the, the attended stimulus or the right word versus attended on the left word. So this is now the fMRI response uh, on the left visual cortex to when you're attending to the right word only. And this is the opposite, the response in the right visual cortex when you're attending to the left word only. And then this is the response to the left and right visual stimulus when you're attending to both words at the same time. And sure enough, you land up here in the corner, which is really kind of cool, right? It looks like V1 is acting sort of in parallel. The attentional effects, you can boost the response indiscriminately regardless of how many, at least one versus two stimuli that you're attending to. We don't know how well that extends to more, um, more targets than two. <clears throat> So let's get off the, um, re the retinotopic continent and see what happens in other parts of the brain. This gets a little more complicated. What about higher visual areas? Um, I'm going to skip the retinotopic. Okay, so these are retinotopic movies. These are fun. I'll show those later if you want. Um, so in the ventral visual cortex, it's still in flux, but we do know that it's pretty easy in some fairly standardized experiments now if you present houses versus scrambled objects or faces versus scrambled objects, you can get little blobs uh, uh, that seem to rep that are part seem to be um, hopefully maybe uh, contain populations of neurons that are selective, at least more selective to some stimulus categories than others. Um, and so Grill Spector has a nice review on this where she's colored in where you know you might see responses that are bigger to faces versus objects. These are purple areas. Um, so it's not just one fusiform face area. There's multiple blobs back there. Um, there's like limbs and places and objects versus scrambled objects. And then we're interested in the words versus objects. Uh, it turns out that if you present words versus objects or scrambled letters, you get very specific little blobs that are 
that don't that are actually not perfectly overlapping with all these other areas. It's called visual word form area, VWFA. And I didn't really believe this until we ran a bunch of subjects. But um, on a typical subject, you will see one blob on the right hemisphere of the brain, and you actually see two blobs on the left hemisphere of the brain. Um, and so that's, they've been labeled visual word form areas one and two. Um, I guess they call this one because there's an only one. And I, <clears throat> turns out that there's a food area. You guys know about this? <laughs> so I mean, this is one of those things about objects, right? How do you how do you pick your categories? It's just you got to make something up, right? But people have done a bunch of machine learning stuff and played around with the data. It turns out that emer out emerged from all this is a food area <laughs> that. Um, Kind of makes sense. We look at food all the time, right? I mean, there's a tool area of the brain. I look at food a lot more than tools, right? Um, so yeah, of course. And this is interesting too, right? Words. Uh, again, we're not evolved to read, and an illiterate person does not have a visual word form area. Children, if you scan kids who haven't or who, haven't, who can't read yet, they don't have a visual word form area either, right? So it's kind of interesting. Brian Wendell's group with Jason Eatman, they showed basically how this word area develops over time. And that's the extent of my knowledge about reading and visual cortex. Um, so visual word form area one um, is somewhat retinotopically specific. In other words, the left visual word form area responds more to this word on the right and vice versa, <clears throat> which is really useful for us because um, we can actually try to measure the response to the left word versus the right word. It's not perfectly retinotopically specific, and I'm pushing stuff under the carpet. So within visual word form area one, there are some pixels or voxels that respond more to one side versus the other. And we're able to use that um, as basically a multi-voxel pattern classification trick to decode well, what the response to a given stimulus left versus right was. So you can think of this as like area V1, where I measured the stimulus on the left by measuring right V1 and vice versa. But it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it worked. And it turns out that if you do that, you end up with a response to the left word and the right word, and you can stick it on the neural AOC axis like this, right? And then you can also plot the response to the conditions we're attending to both words, right? And remember V1, earlier areas, we had visual areas, we ended up here, and um, we ended up there in the visual word form area one as well. So that's interesting. So it looks like visual word form area one at least gets the same attentional boost to both words, um, unlike the behavioral results, right? So we thought we didn't think that was going to happen. We thought maybe we'd end up down here, um, but but no, that's what happened. But what about visual word form area two? Um, so we don't think the bottleneck is in, is in the visual word from area one, at least as far as the boost from attentional effect on the blood flow response is concerned. So where's the bottleneck? Well, we think that, and I'll try to explain this in words, uh, we think it's between visual for, word form area one and two for a variety of reasons. Um, first, we've got two main sources of evidence. And this is kind of a... <clears throat> this one isn't really very satisfying, but the fact is, visual word form area two is not retinotopically, speci retinotopically specific. You can't present a word on the left versus the word on the right and use the pattern of responses in this um, uh, word form area to figure out where the stimulus is presented in the world. It just seems to respond the same regardless of where you put a stimulus. And that's not proof, of course, that the bottleneck is there, but I have this sort of bozo hypothesis about uh, divided attention effects. If, if, if the homunculus that is reading out from a neural population something to be able to do a task, uh, and you have receptive fields that cover the whole visual space, then these, these neurons cannot represent two things at the same time. Right? So that's kind of the fact that it's not written a topic is, is supporting the idea that maybe the bottleneck is in work from area two. And we actually submitted our paper, and, um, and one of the reviewers said, well, that's kind of a weak argument. And they came up with a really good uh, st uh, analysis that we could run. And that was having to do with something called the word frequency effect. 
Um, this is where when reviewers really help you out. We didn't know this, but it turns out that uncommon words produce larger fMRI responses. And it's a pretty robust effect. Why? No idea. If anyone wants to try to tell me, uh, we don't know, but, but it's a fact. And so we can use that because it turns out that in our list of words, some words were more common than others in terms of some index that we were able to, to look up. Okay? So we were able to go back in our analysis and, um, and also the fact that we were, when subjects were doing the two words at the same time, they're really just trying to read the right word and ignoring the left. We were able to use this word frequency effect and measure the response in visual word form area two. It turns out that whenever the word on the right, the right, uh, was common, visual word form area two had a much larger response than when it was an uncommon word. And the frequency, the commonality of the word on the, the guessing side, the left, had no influence on visual word form area two's response. So if things were working in parallel, you would expect the word frequency of both words to have an influence on this word form area two, but really only the word that was able to get through uh, was affecting the size of the response in visual word form area two. So it's not perfect evidence, but we think that this is, this is pretty reasonable evidence that somewhere the bottleneck seems to be between visual word form area one and two, which is kind of cool. Because, you know, I've been studying visual attention with fMRI for a long time, and I meet somebody on the plane or something like that, and they ask me what I do, and I say I study the brain, try to figure out what these bottlenecks are happening. I've never actually done that until now. I just measure changes in attentional effects and things like that, but I've never actually been able to identify this, you know, connection between here and here might be where uh, the filter happens. So that's kind of cool. Um, so in summary, we think basically... Things can, if you're attending two words at the same time, things actually can happen pretty much in parallel up to this point right here. And presumably, when you're trying to do this task, the information you need to read out the information, the, 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 the area needed to, that holds the information you need to read out is presumably up here somewhere, right? Because we can only, the behavioral results are consistent with only one word getting through when you're trying to read two at the same time. <clears throat> so, in summary, Doing fine on time. Uh, reading is inherently a serial process. Um, presented with two words, we can only read one at a time, if you believe our psychophysical results. Um, Snell and Granger, our, our uh, opponents, uh, are arguing for parallel processing and reading and have a, a strong rebuttal to us that we've been fighting with. Interesting. Constructive. Um, it means there must be a bottleneck somewhere in the brain, right? Um, uh, from our results, study, uh, study shows that this bottleneck is probably before visual word form area 2, which is like a secondary brain area associated with the processing of words. <clears throat> and then, so when reading, this is the basic idea is, when we're reading, we don't fixate on every word. Instead, we're probably, within, for each saccade, we're probably switching attention really rapidly um, between the multiple words that land on the retina before we move on to the next word. I don't think we're switching voluntarily, right? Uh, a voluntary switch to spatial attention is pretty slow, but um, <clears throat> you can switch involuntarily, just the visual system is basically just representation. Visual word from area two is first getting one word and then the other one and then moving on from there. <clears throat> and then there's some interesting implications. This is stuff we put in grant proposals. Our study shows there's an interesting relationship between reading and attention. And as many of you know, there's a lot of there's big comorbidity between attentional deficits and dyslexia. Uh, it's very complicated. I think dyslexia is very heterogeneous um, in terms of the causes for, for reading deficits, but some of them may have something to do with attention. You know, the subjects we ran are, I think, 14 subjects in this experiment were not randomly selected from the population. These were graduate students and postdocs and some undergrads, all very experienced readers, probably not normal, normal people, right? Uh, it'd be interesting to see what would happen for people that have um, deficits in reading. Maybe, there's, maybe we would show some attentional deficits in early visual areas, unlike our subjects. Right? Just throwing that out there. I think Jason Yeatman is playing around with that right now down at Stanford. <clears throat> so maybe, perhaps certain reading disabilities are related to our ability to focus and switch our spatial attention. 
And I just want to acknowledge my colleagues, Alex White, who was my postdoc at the time, working with John Palmer and I. He's now uh, at Barnard College in Columbia. They're associated. And Jason Eatman, who Boo left us for Stanford a few years ago, um, pre-COVID, but we're still in touch. And I got lots of time for questions. Thank you. Many thanks indeed, Jeff. Uh, we now have traditionally a short break to let those people who have to get off to other things slip away, and then we have questions. Cool. If you want to see some of these arguments, this is the Snell and Granger rebuttal when we published our last paper on this. They yelled at us, and then we yelled back again. And yeah, <laughs> it's, it's been kind of fun. <clears throat> yes. Uh, highly over-learned or over-trained macaques. Yeah. Um, that may then do things that normally you wouldn't, only after tens of thousands of trials, maybe. And I wonder whether that applies to reading as well, because reading is something we learn over the years, and tens of thousands of trials, and unfortunately some people don't. But um, and we learn, really, the words are word reading strategy, because mm -hmm. that's how you understand text. You can usually only understand the next word if you've understood the first one. You put them into context one by one. I mean, it's a simplifying assumption maybe you know neural networks could potentially take a whole patient understand everything in the world, but at least that's what we learn yeah so maybe we just haven't learned to process two words in parallel and learning even single words obviously takes years so if, if we've used this specialized sort of brain area to process one word that's hard enough but maybe if we would spend years of learning to read several words in parallel in some strange task mm -hmm. people like us you know give our participants then maybe they could learn this yeah, there's a lot there. Um, and yeah, are we overtrained monkeys, basically, when it comes to reading? And this kind of hits on some other stuff that we're working on. We're doing the same sort of work with just objects, um, trying to categorize objects rather than words. Maybe we have more experience with that. Uh, and it does turn out that psychophysically, we haven't done the fMRI version yet, but psychophysically, if you try to categorize two objects at the same time, uh, in terms of whether they're living or non-living or I forgot, or, I forgot the exact task. It doesn't matter too much. Um, you can actually get off the diagonal. You're not out in the corner of the AOC, but you can actually do a little bit in parallel uh, when you try to divide your attention between objects versus words. I don't know what, I don't know what that means. It has something to do with the receptive field sizes in object recognition areas. Maybe they're a little bit smaller in the visual word form area. I'm not sure, but yeah, there's a lot, a lot going on there. Um, another thing you mentioned, context. So our words are totally unrelated. So Snell and Granger talk about this. Our words are totally unrelated. And of course, when you're reading, there's all this context. Um, and we all, you know, that if you're, gonna, if, you, if you're asked to read and remember a bunch of just words in a paragraph that are just a bunch of random words, you're not going to skip as much. You're going to actually read every word. So Snell and Granger would argue that if there's a lot of context, then, then maybe you can work faster and maybe you can work a little bit more in parallel. Um, we haven't run a, a version of the psychophysical experiment where there's a relation between the left and right word. Um, it's complicated because you have to kind of mimic reading or something like that. Maybe there's some good ideas there. So maybe you can get off the diagonal in a more natural condition where you've got words that are related to each other on the left and the right side. Can I follow that up yeah. and ask you about the definition of words, a very deep problem, yeah. which is, you know, in different languages. Mm -hmm. uh, what constitutes a word is very different. But even in English, we have varied degrees of compound. Mm -hmm. So you can have yes. greyhound. That's the exact kind of experiment could, we're going to do, yeah. Yeah, you could have great hound, which I think is not hyphenated. Or uh, any British uh, lover of beer <laughs> would see as virtually one unit hare and hounds. <laughs> uh, and uh, I would imagine that in uh, the masking experiment, behavioral experiments, uh, you would be able to deal with those compounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would have to imply that the words got to a level of semantic analysis if before being any, uh, 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 all of those words, all the components, got as far as semantic analysis. 
Yes, and we were thinking about that. I mean, so you could do something like air and plane, <laughs> right, and houseboat, or split up a word like that. In that sense, you kind of, what is a word, right? You've actually kind of just split the word between the left and right hemisphere, and you're no longer reading two words. You're reading one word. It just happened to have a space in the middle of it. So it's, it's, it's not obvious how to run the context experiment. Um, what, yeah, what is a word? <clears throat> yeah. The, yes, so. Okay. Thank you. Um, so is the way you make perception or conceptual? So imagine like, um, I don't know anything about working memory and I think values in the age by four. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking about that. But um, imagine that uh, you have kind of nonsense words that we can match them in terms of um, their perceptual context and how many characters you mm have -hmm. and then go left and right. Um, and so would you have the same kind of effect? So if you, if you're trying, so yeah, Alex Wade has a series of experiments he's been doing at Columbia now, or at Barnard, where he is varying the level of processing, that was part of his big K award, was the level of processing for words, from semantic all the way down to, you know, lexical, or even just, you know, whether there's a vowel in there or not. And I'm not sure exactly what he's getting, but I'm pretty sure that the, the, the lower the level you get, the further you can get off the diagonal. That makes any sense, All right? So you really need to be gleaning. It's not just the processing of the of the physical stimulus mm -hmm. itself. Um, it has to be more about the meaning of the word. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm curious then for this like divided attention paradigm. You mentioned that there's superior performance when you read the words and write. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, yeah, have there been any studies perhaps like drilled down into like why that might be? I'd be curious for like I don't know. Um, maybe in languages where people might read from right to left, yes. like in Arabic, um, whether like maybe it's on the left that has to be or Hebrew. I don't know the answer to that. Does anyone know the answer to that? I, I, as far as I, I, it's the obvious thing to study, right? Let's do Hebrew, Arabic, or something like that, and see if it flips. Because that would. Yeah. I, I don't know the answer, but I was wondering what the I dominance plays for all this well, eye dominance, of course, is not the same as retina topy, right? Because your left eye doesn't pres doesn't represent the right side of the world. It's the left visual field, so it shouldn't be eye dominance. You should get this with just one eye, right? You should be able to, because each eye gets both sides of the visual field, right? Um, so, I mean, there's a region in the very far periphery that it's because your nose only gets one side of the visual field. But where we are, both eyes get both words, so that's probably not a factor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was puzzled by the naturalization of these first visual form word areas because I was thinking sometimes, yeah. as you showed when you're reading, you hit the center of a word. Mm -hmm. And so, presumably, then after the word is going to one hemisphere and half, yeah. you're doing this first area. Uh, and so, so, sometimes, surely the system has to decide to combine those inputs to go up to the second area. And I was even then more puzzled when sometimes, as you were saying, the two halves may or may not be part of the same word. Right. So it's a really interesting challenge there as to how the system would decide should I combine this information or not. Well, we don't know, and we don't know, we don't know the physiology in humans, but we know that, at least as far as fMRI is concerned, unlike, so the early visual areas, a voxel or a pixel in V1 will only respond to a stimulus in the contralateral visual field. <coughs> Excuse me. But in the visual word form area 1, um, both stimuli will excite a voxel. Um, but one might excite it slightly more than the other. So I can picture these, like, individual neurons receptive field is pretty, pretty broad, including crossing the meridian, but maybe not covering the whole visual field. So that's why you get a slight bias in some voxels versus another. Um, so I think that's how we deal with that, because it, it is curious, you know, how do we, with this two hemispheres of the brain, how come we don't, like, see the world like a dividing line down the middle? You have to work pretty hard to get psychophysical results where there's weird hemisphere effects like that, and like Alvarez's multiple object tracking and things like that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, in the control paradigm that you had with covers, yeah. reporting, can I ask you about the masks that you used there? If they are removing the color information? So, good question. We did not use color masks. Um, we have gone back and we have do we're doing that right now because that is, that is an issue, right? Yeah, because the masks mask the meaning but not the color so that's a problem yeah very good observation <clears throat> really that experiment rules out um, memory and response you know limitations but not so much the attentional thing very good <clears throat> yeah um, 
how much of this is about um, reading and how much about just, or, or language and how much is the complexity of the stimuli? I mean, you know, these are very complex <coughs> intellectual stimuli, if you like, you're having to, that you're having to um, process it. If you, make, if you have a sufficiently difficult task that wasn't reading later. Yeah, so we, we're now messing around with other complex stimuli. We have, um, we were doing these, um, we're trying to come up with objects that are, don't have semantic meaning. So we've got these, these Duplo blocks, these big Legos that are the same blocks but um, arranged in different um, arrangements. <laughs> and we're trying to get people to, to do the same different task, divided attention and that sort of thing with complex objects. And we are getting big divided attention effects there as well. So I don't think it's necessarily words that you need, but it, it is, um, and I don't know what part of the brain are we trying to like, be reading out to do that task. Um, but um, that's, a, yeah, that's a good observation. And like I said, we stumbled in this because we just tried to come up with a, something we thought might be hard to do. Um, the other, the other aspect is that um, <clears throat> if you can process both of these stimuli in parallel up to, you know, up, up to a kind of orthographic level but can't then get the semantics, yeah. why can't you just uh, get the semantics for one hold the other in, in visual working memory and then, and then get the semantics back. And I think you can do that if without the mask, right? But if it doesn't get past early visual processing, well, but it is getting past early visual processing, so I don't know, I don't know the answer to that question, right? Because we, we, <clears throat> yeah, I don't think it can get into memory that way. It's just not enough time with the, with the mask there. But, we're getting the attentional boost of the stimulus. But you can think of like spatial attention as being some sort of stupid mechanism that there's really no cost in a retinotopic area to just boost the neural response to a, an attended stimulus, regardless of what you're trying to do, right? Because it's all happening in parallel. But eventually, you run into bottlenecks. So, yeah, I just don't, I think maybe you're getting a bigger response to these stimuli, but they're not getting into memory. <clears throat> because. It could be, yeah. We don't have baseline with fMRI, that's the problem, right? Yeah. Can you try to pair one word and one word? No. Um, or a face and a word or something like that. So according to my Bozo hypothesis, these are two separate populations, right? You should be able to do this in parallel. Oh, yes. That's in my grant proposal that just got rejected. <laughs> um, but you know, um, but yeah, great experiment. Aim three. <laughs> yeah, I, and it actually, subjectively, I don't feel like I'd be able to do that, right? But according to our but our model, we should, right? You should. might expect that these are two different categories. Mm -hmm. and they don't process the same way, so you could do it in parallel. Yeah, right. Go ahead and try it. <laughs> it's out there, yeah. On, on the use of mask to terminate the icon, mm -hmm. Hannah Smithson and I showed a decade ago that it doesn't work. For what? If you, if, if, for words. Uh -huh, really? If you present a word, you present a mask, then you have a partial report cue. Mm -hmm. There's still a partial report effect. And the mm -hmm. idea is that the icon is four-dimensional. That, you know, when I do something like that, you have a memory of not a slice of time, mm -hmm. but of a trajectory I see. In, in a four-dimensional representation. <laughs> I wonder why it worked for us. Well, that's interesting. Well, within this four-dimensional icon, there's crowding. Mm -hmm. So the closer things are in time, the more they crowd each other. Yes. So that's... Oh, I see. That's, the, that's what we say. Any more questions? Yeah. Yes, Lee. I've got one that's inspired by your first Zhang Wang, John, when you were talking about the sort of challenges of getting information between different areas of the yeah. brain. Um, yeah, it'd be kind of nice if we could just read these words in parallel mm -hmm. um, and have you know this second visual cord from area being able to represent lots of words. And you said that that might be because it's not retinotopic. But I'm also wondering, you know, the sort of 
you need a lot of connections to be passing everything in parallel between V1 to V2 and V2 to V3. Yeah. Is there something that you're just speculating, like is there maybe something different about you know, the wiring between V2 and V3 than between the first visual waveform area and the second visual waveform area? Yeah, and that's a, that's a loaded question. And another way to think about it also is um, maybe we there's no point in having it operate in parallel because language is serial. Spoken language is definitely serial, right? So we've probably, you can argue that maybe there's some evolutionary pressure for the brain to be able to understand spoken language, right? Uh, and so maybe reading is just a representation of spoken language and therefore it there's, doesn't make any sense for the brain to process language in parallel, right? Um, so it's not really a bug, it's just part of the way language operates. Just yeah. one more thought um, for the word from memory question. Um, if you make the word shorter, or, and if you go down to even just a single letter, does, can be process those? We've looked at word length down to three letter words, and it's still still get the same effect. Now, we didn't do the brain imaging side, but behavioral, we've done a bunch of behavioral studies. It works for three letters. I don't know about single letters. Um, I know Alex is messing around with that right now. He's got a VSS poster on that. Yeah. Yeah. How far the, the center of the words were from fixation? Oh, um, I think the inside were three degrees out from fovea. The inside, so the, the outside. The outside, I'm not sure how big they were. I have to look it up. How much um, I don't, yeah, I know you study crowding, right? And I read your divided attention in crowding paper. We, well, whose rule is it the half degree, half distance, something, something rule? Um, uh, Bauman's, Bauman's, Bauman's rule. Bauman's we kept it outside of Baum's rule because John Palmer is my colleague who studies. Well, so, it's half an eccentricity. Yeah. So you have to have so, spacing between the words yeah. or between the objects. Half an eccentricity. Yeah. 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 Half an eccentricity. Half an eccentricity. Yeah. 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 Half an Mm -hmm. I mean, the crowding exists. You know, well, that's my point. So, crowding happens without a mask. Without a mask. And if we do our experiment. With unlimited, with unlimited time. Right. So, if you do our experiment um, without a mask, you can read both can words. Read both. Yeah. So yeah. We don't think it's crowding here. Yeah. 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 We've done that. And it actually works. You don't get any bias. Um, okay. We haven't done the fMRI version of that either. I don't have the money to do it yet either, uh, but um, yeah, it, you get the same psychophysical effect. You get a, you land on the diagonal, actually you're in the middle on the diagonal. There's no bias towards the up, upper, or lower. There's a little bit of a bias towards the lower hemi field for objects, I think, but not for words. And there's nothing like the left right for words. Yeah. Is it important to use letters as the mark? No, actually, we've done a different, a few different things. Yeah, mm. yeah, we've used nonsense characters and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. and some Fourier thing we scrambled in the Fourier domain, right? It still works. <clears throat> At this moment, that great Yorkshireman Wilfred Pickles would say, "Give in the money, Mabel," <laughs> and I. I I hope you do get this funded. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, we need money for my own imaging center too, so I need to this fund myself. Uh, many thanks indeed for a marvelous talk that's drawn a lot of uh, shrewd questions. Yes, yeah, questions. Uh, if anyone has more questions for Jeff, um, or just like a drink after the Zangles, so, um, you'll find us in All Bar One. But let's say 10 to 6, and it's my obligation to buy anyone a drink that I recognize. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much indeed.